middle caste or any of the upper caste you do not face the a lower cost face like in everyday life uh, and that includes like uh, uh, the basic things like uh, i'll give it give you an example uh, let's say uh, we are going to file an fir to the police for, for some simple crime now what happens is uh, when a guy from uh, lower caste uh, goes to file the fir there is a big chance that that fir will not be written especially if it is against uh, uh, someone from the upper caste so uh, there is systematic casteism which upper caste people do not have to face and lower caste people have to face that uh, on like a regular basis okay so the caste system uh, before we talked about how the caste system was in you know kind of shaped by the hindu religion and mm -hmm. actually the um hindu religion and the caste system that it created is part of why you became an atheist. So could you tell us more about how the caste system was shaped by the Hindu religion? Because a lot of us view Hinduism as very liberal and, you know, so we don't necessarily um, fully understand how it has shaped the caste system and how that negatively impacts people all over India yeah so uh, basically hinduism is a liberal religion that is so basically we have a 5000 year old year old history so uh, the time at which this ramayana and mahabharata was uh, were written uh, at that time hinduism was at its peak so at that time there was a, a varna system so varna system was basically uh, you will get jobs according to your qual qualifications right. according to uh, what you have learned so like uh, if if you if you if you are good in studies you will uh, get to become a priest or uh, you will get to become a teacher if you are good good in war and stuff then you will become a warrior or you can go on to become a king so that was basically merit based only merit based so what happens as the time pass so there was uh, there were few reformers uh, one of them is um, called manu so he came up with a book called manusmriti and manusmriti is basically the foundation of caste system it is Called, called the foundation of caste system in India. So what they uh, decided, what they started to uh, do is, like uh, if someone is Brahmin now, his son will also be Brahmin. So they created this nepotism in, in everything. So let's say someone is working in, into uh, some lower jobs, cleaning jobs, then now his, his son will also work in the same job. So they, they created this, uh, uh, you can say, family-based uh, jobs and culture. So that that divided people into caste. They they assigned caste to everyone. So instead of merit, now it was uh, where you are born, uh, where you are born, according to that it became. So uh, it was, I think, during uh, 500 AD, I think uh, the, the, uh, that somewhere it started, it started all down. And even even in the even in the uh, Mahabharata, Mahabharata text, there, there are a couple of in, examples of casteism. So there is a chance that it is, did exist at that time also, but there are not many proofs. So I cannot say about that. But uh, uh, after that, like uh, after we came into the Manu era, since then the caste is a Manusmriti is a very, very, uh, that book is uh, solely responsible for caste system and also the uh, increased sexism inside Hinduism. So in Hinduism, there are like uh, many goddesses. So Hinduism used to consider uh, men and women very equal uh, but manusmriti again introduced so much of sexism uh, like, like uh, many of many of manusmriti uh, texts like uh, describe women says uh, they should only work in the home they should not go out or anything so th they are kind of property of the men so manusmriti has such lines so manusmriti had had a very bad bad effect on the indian system but People wanted to consolidate power. People wanted to uh, pass the power uh, to the generations, uh, to their own generations. So people went ahead with this. And since uh, uh, now like this, the caste system was born because uh, the two upper castes, like the warrior caste and, and the priest caste, they had all the knowledge. So what happened is uh, one big thing is the priest caste and the warrior caste, they uh, stopped lower caste people from, from learning basic learning sanskrit was the language of that time so they forbid uh, lower caste from learning sanskrit so they cannot read sanskrit they cannot write they cannot 
read the ancient text so they not they do not know about their rights so they are basically in the dark so that's why it took a very long time to some reformists to come up and say that we want equal rights just like just like what happened with black people in africa or oh, sorry in uh, usa so right. there there was a reformist named dr bhimra ambedkar who was also a uh, indian freedom fighter as well he, uh, he worked with uh, mahatma gandhi so dr bhimra ambedkar was from one of this uh, lower caste so uh, there was a story from his ch- childhood uh, one day he was uh, coming back from school and it started raining so he was on foot so it started raining so he tried to uh, take a shelter near uh, nearby in a nearby house so he just uh, went ahead and uh, stood st- stood uh, below the house so uh, outside only so what happens is that house belong to a, an upper caste man so the w- the woman of the house came uh, came outside and she asked him like uh, what is your caste and when he when he told that i am from mahar caste which is a lower caste so she just uh, asked asked him to go away it, that you you cannot stand here so that is said to have a very big impact on bimra ambedkar so bimra ambedkar went on to uh, become a very big reformist uh, just like you can say you can compare him to martin, martin luther king junior in uh, uh, usa so he was a reformist of that level uh, Ma- dr bimra ambedkar said that i was born a hindu but i shall never die a hindu he was he was uh, so like uh, uh influenced by this caste system so disheartened by this caste system he decided to leave hinduism but uh, some i think uh, uh, dr bimra ambedkar was great and all but one thing that i think uh, was problem with him and uh, he he was a very weak personality i shouldn't be criticizing him i think but this this is something that i personally believe it is uh, not something so he when he left hinduism he went to buddhism so there there is something there is something inside him that that tells him that you cannot live without a religion something told him that you cannot re- live without a religion that's why he left hinduism and went to buddhism now people will say buddhism is a great religion buddhism is a religion of peace yes every li- religion say that they are a religion of peace but you just have to wait and see what religions become like we have seen in myanmar what buddhism has like uh, um, Buddh- um, buddhist have done to the rohingya peoples of myanmar so no religion no religion uh, no matter how liberal it is no religion is actually uh, uh, compatible with the human rights with the uh, liberal values and all so that's what uh, he left hinduism and went to buddhism with his i think uh, 350000 followers so he was uh, one of the big reformists and still uh even after he he created a basically a reservation system uh according to which lower caste will get a reservation like everywhere in the jobs and education and all so that exists till now it started when india got independence due to bhimrao ambedkar it was incorporated in the constitution and even till now uh, there is a reservation for a lower caste system still the casteism is there uh even after all that even after that big chunk of reservation the caste rhythm still exists and the reservation is basically making people uh, go more anti lower caste because uh, upper caste people see this as uh, like uh, our rights are being uh, taken away like uh, these seats are reserved for them like 50% right. seats are seats are reserved so that is actually actually a polarizing thing now in the society oh well, yeah you know like in america it was the same way you know when people try to fight for equality for african americans the white people they didn't view that as black people trying to get equal rights they viewed it as their rights being taken away yep yeah that the i mean i mean uh, reservation actually something that only uh, rich lower caste people have have access to the actual poor lower caste people do not ha- have access to the reservation so they are not getting the benefit of that reservation that's why uh, most of the poverty still exist in the lower caste and still there is a uh, casteism present inside indian society so we'll have to come 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 up with something uh, more sophisticated something a better approach to reservation uh, not on the basis of caste maybe on the basis of uh, economic uh, conditions of the family 
so that that could something that could that could alleviate those uh, families from a poor background to something like people can get educated in, th in those families so yeah that is something some change is need needed in the reservation system i'm i'm also not a big supporter of that system because uh, no the deserving people are not getting uh, the benefits of that reservation so yeah that's act actually the, it has been more than 70 years and it it hasn't uh, changed much uh, to the caste system so there there must be something as at fault so yeah that system is not working properly okay so i have heard of the laws of manu and i actually have a digital copy of that book i've never read it but i didn't know that it played such an influential role in the caste system and as i told you before i have read the mahabharata and the Ramayana, you know, years ago in about 2008, yeah. and I always viewed them as very liberal and, you know, not too prescriptive, you know, like, for example, when you read the Mahabharata Yudhishthira, who's the, I don't know, I guess you could say the prime protagonist, he's a king yeah. of many virtues, and he's so virtuous that his chariot floats like three inches off the ground, and after he lies you know and he he ruins his virtuousness then his chariot no longer floats on the ground i mean it no longer floats above the ground so yeah. it seemed like even even though he was a king he wasn't above you know being judged and so when i read that book i never got the idea that you know one person was better than another and the perspective that you give me is more analytical you know especially for an outsider because like I said, you know, when you read the Ramayana or the Mahabharata, it's like reading Greek mythology, you know, you view it as something that's enjoyable, uh, a leisurely read, and you never think about the societal impacts of it. Yeah, so as I said yesterday as well, so uh, I consider Ramayana and Mahabharata and there is uh, another text called uh, Gita. Gita is basically a collection yeah. of what? Lord Krishna said to Arjun. So those texts I consider as literature masterpiece. So those are uh, very, very big literatures and very beautifully written. But there is still casual sexism, casual casteism is present inside the Mahabharata and Ramayana, even though to a very lesser extent, but still it is there. Like one story I told you about uh, Sita and Pietist in Ramayana. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Could you talk about yeah. that again? Yeah, okay. So the story is uh, like uh, when uh, in Ramayana, the Lord Rama, who is considered to be a, a incarnation of uh, God, God Vishnu. So when he defeated Ravana, who was an evil king. So basically what Ravana did was Ravana kidnapped Sita, who was wife of Ram. So Ravana kidnapped Sita and kept her, kept her with him. And then when Ram defeated Ravana, uh, he got Sita back. Then he asked Sita, to go through a fire test to prove her innocence that she was innocent so that is the first example of sexism because ram ram never had to go through a fire test only sita had to go through the fire test so after sita went through the, went through the fire test she passed the test they came back to their home city and one day ram was visiting his people and he overheard, her, overheard one of them saying like uh, sita was with uh, ravana for so many days and we cannot uh, uh, we cannot believe that she is pure innocent and all. So even though she did pass the fire test, Ram abandoned Sita again, just because he overheard some people saying that she she lives with uh, she lives in the uh, city of Ravana. So again he abandoned Sita. At that time Sita was pregnant. She went into the forest. There was a sage who kept her uh, inside his uh, home. So there she she had his two children her two childrens. And those children came to Ram in his palace and told him how she, she, uh, that you did wrong with Sita. Uh, what you did was wrong. So Ram realized his mistake and he uh, like called Sita again to the palace. And there uh, they asked her to uh, her to go through the fire test again. And at that time, Sita actually lost. Uh, you can say yeah, she she was frustrated. So she basically asked the mother to take her back because Sita is considered to be the daughter of Mother Earth because she was not she was not naturally born. She was found uh, beneath the earth. So that's that's why she's considered the uh, daughter of Earth. So she asked the Mother Earth to take her back. And at that time, there was a crack in, in the earth and Sita went uh, below the earth. So 
yeah that's that's what actually uh, the biggest example of sexism inside Ram ramayana yeah i actually remember that story because when i read the book if i remember correctly ravana had one of his servants appear in the form of a deer and so when ram and his brothers went to pursue the deer that's when ravana kidnaps uh sita yep. Yep. and um when i was a kid growing up um at my great grandmother's house we always used to watch a movie called the little princess and it's about a white girl uh living in um colonial india and uh, i believe her father was in the military and so um she's told stories from the ramayana and if you watch that movie uh there's a scene where ravana uh kidnaps uh sita you know it's uh uh it's a, a children's movie, but it has some of uh, um, the Hindu mythology woven into it. And when you yeah. watch it, you view it as you know just a story. You know, so once again, you don't view um, you don't view it as something that has a negative societal impact. You just view it in the same way that you view like a Disney movie, like Snow White or Cinderella. Yeah, that's that's how I think we should uh, see the ancient text. We should see this as a movie. If if we like something, we take it. If we do not like something, we discard it. But when people start imposing uh, the religion, then they can just justify anything using those books. And this is true for all the religions. All the religions, anything can be justified using the books. Like you have read the Mahabharata. Okay, right. so Mahabharat, uh, there are. Uh, when just before the war is going to start, uh, I mean, uh, you might know that Mahabharata is all about a big war. Right. There's a big war happening between Pandava and Kaurava. So just before the war is going to start, uh, Arjun Arjun is one of the Pandavas. So he is uh, very hesitant because he's fighting against his cousins and all. So he's very hesitant to uh, fight with them. So at that time, uh, the person who is dri driving his chariot, that is actually Lord Krishna, who is another god in Hindu, uh, Hindu religion. So he uh, tells him like, uh, why sh you should fight. So that what he tells him at the time of that battle is recorded in another text. And that is actually the biggest te text of Hinduism. And that is called Srimad Bhagavad Gita or Gita in shorts. So Gita tells you how to live a life. So none of these texts tell tells you how to live a life. Mahabharata is a story, Ramayana is a story. Gita is actually uh, a book that will tell you how the life so basically that is uh, what uh, bible is to the christians or quran is to the muslims gita is to the hinduism so inside gita there is one phrase that is used again and again and that is ahinsa parbo dharma which means that non-violence is the greatest religion so that that phrase is used again and again now if you want to follow the non-violence you can justify that from the bhagavad gita like uh, the god himself is saying that uh, non-violence is the biggest dharma now, if you want to become violent, you want to do something uh, violent in the name of religion, you can justify that again because Mahabharata was all about a war. Uh, Krishna justified uh, to Arjun that you have to fight against your cousin because they, they are doing something wrong. So you can justify the violence as well as non-violence using the same book. So that's what I think uh, the biggest thing that the religious text, any of the religious texts, be it Quran, be it Bible, Everything that that is the biggest thing they are they are lacking. They can be used from any side. I have read the uh, Bhagavad Gita, and I didn't yeah. like it as much as I like the Ramayana or the Mahabharata. For me, it was actually a little boring, or that yeah, could, because that could just yeah, be the translation a... that I read. But um, the guy who translated it, um, he does a really good introduction, and he said that the best religions. Uh, self-destruct and what he meant by that is uh, somewhere or at some point the text tell you that they don't really need them you know like he said that if you read the Bhagavad Gita you know the what you get from that is you don't really need it to live a good life and yep. you know with um, you know with the Abrahamic religions you know like Islam and Christianity it's the opposite they tell you that you do need them you do need, need them for eternal life. You need them to have purpose. You need them to be moral. 
yeah so bhagavad gita is basically uh, teaches you many different thing there are shlokas in bhagavad gita that will tell you that only your work is everything so if you are doing your work right then that's all that's all you need to need, need to do in life then there are verses that will tell you that uh, you have to pray to the god and you have to remember the god always like whatever you you are going to do so that uh, that is basically something i think that is contradicting in, it, in itself in one verse they are saying that uh, work is everything and right. in other other verse they are saying that uh, you have to pray to the god god yeah i got so, i got that too from that yeah yeah but you know even though i didn't find it as enjoyable as i found the mahabharata or the ramayana i still don't view it as negatively as i view like the quran or the bible you know there was nothing that i took from that that i felt you know encourage violence or misogyny or yeah. even yeah. too much dependence when you when you compare it compare it to bible or quran it is way more liberal those texts are way more liberal when you compare it to bible and quran but uh, as as i said even, even the slightest of things can be used as a justification so those those are uh, as i said earlier those are the literature masterpiece those, those are the like the one of the best texts that has been written but still there is a casual sexism casual casteism that exists inside those stories basically you find mahabharata and ramayana interesting because those were story form those are basically big stories and right. bhagavad gita is not a story bhagavad gita is uh, the idea how how do you how do you live your life right. so that's how that's what bhagavad gita is so that's why you might have find it bo- found it boring yeah, so because reading the mahabharata or the ramayana it's like reading the iliad or the odyssey and actually yep. a lot of people yep. in the western world they do compare the ramayana and the mahabharata to the iliad and the odyssey yeah so i had let me uh look at this other question that i had for you because i didn't want to forget it so um the other question i wanted to ask you is uh what is it like being an atheist in india sorry i lost you can you repeat the question okay uh yeah i, I don't know i don't know if that was on my end or your end but the next question i had is what it's like to be an atheist in india okay yeah so uh being an atheist in india is okay as long as uh, you do not go around insulting god and all so uh, in the recent years it it has been a trend uh, doesn't matter if you are atheist or you are agnostic anything you can be you you cannot go in public and insult the gods so basically that is uh, that that can get you beaten and uh, there has been cases uh, in the past where like uh, uh, mostly uh, stand up comedians a couple of stand up comedians have been uh, beaten and uh, fir was filed on them and uh, they were sent to the judicial custody as well and at that time only like a couple of years ago only i found out that indian constitution still has blasphemy laws so if you if you insult gods of any religion there is a law in constitution that can make you go to the, go to the jail you have to serve the jail sentence that i found out like uh, very recently because these laws were never used in the past uh, this this level of uh, intolerance was never there hinduism was quite tolerant uh, they did not care if you ins- in, if you were insulting to gods i mean no no one should care like uh, it's it's someone's personal opinion there is there is nothing uh, if if you really consider your god to be so great then i don't think the god care who is uh, some if someone is insulting them if you really believe in your god you you, sh- you shouldn't get offended by someone insulting them because uh, right. you think uh, you think he can take care of them he can take care of uh, so, uh, some puny humans insulting insulting a god so uh, that trend actually has grown in india so people are more offended people are more intolerant uh, basically there is a new law that came into the force a couple of couple of weeks ago uh, which actually uh, renews uh, which has new guidelines for the ott platform like uh, in some of the web series that was released on netflix and amazon prime uh, there were some scenes that people thought were up, uh, offensive to the hinduism 
because uh, again those were some people making fun of gods and uh, some 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 things were like uh, yeah one of the scenes were like two people were kissing inside a temple a couple was kissing inside a temple so people got offended by that and then the uh, the web series that uh, the company that created the web series had to apologize had to remove that content and uh, uh, that actually increased the demand for ott regula reg regulation and now we have new laws for ott regulation like uh, what kind of things are not allowed on netflix amazon prime web series so yeah in in that that form you can compare it to i mean i won't say we are there but uh, i mean i'd say we are going towards what uh, where saudi arabia is uh, the like uh, the kind of blasphemy laws and the kind of uh, uh, ott regulations and all in saudi arabia that that's where we are going in in a sense we are a uh, very far, far from there but that's a uh, that's a way that we are heading okay so do you think that's partly in response to islam because islam is a very uncompromising yeah. religion and it seems that Indians are becoming more militant as a response to Islam. Yep, yep. That's that's a, that's a very big reason. So basically, uh, Muslims are uh, all, uh, a minority religion in India, but uh, they are twenty percent uh, uh, of the Indian population. So that makes them uh, like twenty five, thirty million. So that that is actually a big number. That is more than the population of uh, uh, Pakistan. Sorry, not twenty five, thirty million. It is, I mean. 200 or 300 million so that is that is more than the population of pakistan which is so which was separated from india for uh, being a muslim home country to the muslims so there is a large population uh, in india of uh, muslims and muslims islam is a very conservative like uh, we can say it is most conservative of all the religions uh, present in in the world so that was a narrative used by the present government they said that, that uh, Hindus are acting secular, uh, but these uh, Muslims are not acting secular. So what, what should we do about it? We should also become uh, more religious. We should all, also start defending our religion. So things like these uh, were like uh, into people. Okay, you just cut uh, off. Like a uh, cow is very Yeah, you cut yeah. out for Hello. for a few seconds. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't hear yeah. the last part. Yeah. So basically, uh, so what uh, in response to the Islamist uh, extremis extremism, like uh, there were many terrorist attacks in India, mostly sponsored from sponsored from Pakistan. So it was all blamed on Indian Muslims were also blamed for that. So even though, yeah, in some cases, like uh, in most of the cases, like uh, if you make a joke on Muhammad and anything on Islam, so Muslims get triggered more easily than Hindu Hindus, so that was that were the things that uh, present government used uh, to polarize Hindus, and uh, yeah, they have been increasingly uh, uh, capitalizing on it. You can say now we have uh, there was a cow protection law actually came into the force, so beef beef eating was banned in in the India in India. So people uh, in many states, some of states still allow eating beef. But in most of the state, eating beef is banned for now. And uh, there is actually government came up with uh, something called cow science. So a ministry for cow, they came up with a, a whole ministry uh, dedicated to the cows. And uh, they introduced a new subject called cow science and they started an exam in it. So there is a certification exam you can take in the cow science. So now uh, they are trying to involve uh, religion with the state. And that's that's the something which democracy should not allow. And in a democracy, religion and state should always be separate. But uh, they are they are mixing everything now, and that is actually something I do not consider good for the Indian democracy. Okay, so you see India as heading in the direction of a theocracy, and so I guess um, my next question would be. Um, what do you think will be the pros and cons of that? Because I think we can both agree that Islam is a worse religion than Hinduism, but in their attempt to uh, preserve their own culture and to root out um, 
Islam, do you think that Hinduism could become just as bad as Islam is right now? Yep, yep. Uh, definitely it will become just as bad because uh, the main main thing is, uh, I mean, uh, right now, uh, the secular Hindus are feeling, uh, not feeling well about this idea. So basically there is an idea called Hindu Rashtra. Hindu Rashtra is uh, basically in English, you can translate it to a nation of Hindus. That is basically a theocratic nation which will be ruled by Hindus. Now this idea is, uh, I mean, they, you, you can understand that they want to make India a Hindu nation, but it is not limited to India. The India that they define, the India is uh, that is mentioned in the ancient text. That is present day Pakistan, present day Bangladesh and some parts of Afghanistan as well. So the idea is to uh, uh, make all these lands a Hindu Rashtra, a Hindu nation. So that ideology will be actually uh, very non-beneficial, you can say, to the uh, secular population. Especially, uh, I think the biggest biggest uh, con, I think, is that caste system will be a proactive force again. So the lower caste will be facing a discrimination again. They will be uh, again forced into almost uh, a slavery-like slavery uh, um, lifestyle. So that will be the biggest problem with, with this. And also, I mean, any theocratic society is basically wrong. So you, you are uh, forcing people to follow a religion that is inherently wrong. So if, even now, the secular secular Hindus, none of them want India to become a Hindu Rashtra. It can be maintained through a democracy. There is, there is no need to uh, become a theocracy to preserve your culture. Culture can be very well protected by a democracy. Yeah, I agree. We have... Uh similar um christian nationalism in the united states you know they feel like every christmas there's a war on christmas and they constantly feel like there's a war on christians and in response they feel that they need to be more militant they need to push christianity even more because if they don't then christianity is just going to disappear when in reality you know all the evidence does not suggest that you know, we live in a majority Christian country. We have, you know, thousands of churches, you know, and I mean, there's just no evidence that Christianity is under an attack. You know, it's an uh, entirely fabricated narrative. Yeah, it's, it's the same in India, actually. So there is there is a narrative uh, ev everywhere. Like, uh, uh, like uh, if there is a normal protest ongoing, and somehow they found a find a foreign link to it. They will say that this is anti-Hindu, this is anti-national. So they will say that foreign forces are meddling to destroy India. Foreign forces are meddling to destroy Hinduism. So this is uh, basically a state of paranoia. I will say this uh, state of uh, uh, yeah absolute paranoia. So <laughs> uh, right. in the recent uh, farmer protests that were that are going on. So basically. Uh, earlier, what Hindu Rashtra, the Hindu word Hindu in the Hindu Rashtra used to be considered as Hindu means all Indian religions. That means Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, Sikhism, and all. Now, the recent former protestants, the, uh, those has been going on. Uh, they have also uh, like uh, antagonized Sikh religions. So they have started calling Sikh religions as anti-Hindu, anti-Indian, and anti-national. And they said that they are trying to make uh, their own on nation which is Khalistan which is basically an idea that uh, that is a fringe element in Punjab state some people in believe in that idea but majority of Punjab do not believe in uh, idea of Khalistan as has been uh, proved with various surveys and all but they use that idea to actually uh, you can say undermine the protest and actually polarize the Hindus more towards uh, this theocratic society so now the uh, Indian religions are also getting ex excluded from the idea of Hindu Rashtra. So I'm pretty sure that by the time we reach this idea of Hindu Rashtra, uh, only the Hindus will be there and only the upper caste Hindus will be there. So they will antagonizing ev uh, antagonize everything. That's that is something that I, I have I have all, uh, always been saying. Like let's say if we remove all the Muslim like right now from the India, then still India will be very much a divided country because the caste system exists inside Hinduism and that is a very big dividing force and India will still be divided even if we did not have Muslim. We have Muslim, they, they, get, a, they get a common enemy in them. Uh, politician can point out to the Muslim and say that 
like these people are uh, are your en enemies and that's how they consolidate votes but that is actually creating a deep divide in the society i would say like uh, usa and india are at same place currently the the amount of uh, divide in in the in the society in usa is amount of uh, it's the same divide in india as well like those are the two country i i would say are currently identical in terms of hate with uh, in the mind of the minds of the people okay so yesterday um we talked a little bit about uh you know how you became an atheist and if i remember right you told me that the caste system is part of what made you an atheist and i think that's really um interesting and it's really commendable because a lot of people who are born into a comfortable class or a comfortable station in life they don't really think about people in a lower caste so how did that all you know like snowball into um you know where you are today okay so yeah basically i won't say that caste system made me atheist i'll explain so basically i became an atheist at a very early age like i was 13 14 from what i can remember okay uh, so i became an atheist because uh, i tried to see normal things like uh, you can see that god has no control over your life what okay. what you do that will give you success or failure god has no part in part in it whether you pray to the god or not so uh, this was a very common thing anyone anyone can see it i don't i don't know why other can't can't see it so that's how i stopped believing in god now i had this idea i i considered myself a hindu atheist so what hindu atheist what by hindu atheist i mean is i considered hinduism as a way of life so uh, i uh, followed hinduism as a way of life but i did not believe in god so at that time i started exploring the history of hinduism how hinduism has behaved over the centuries so uh, like we have a 5000 year old, old history so i started uh, digging into that then i came across this casteism actually i did see the casteism like in my real life but i did not think of it as a big deal because i was not aware of it i did not think that this is a uh, this is a big thing that this should be this should what people should be concerned about but when i dig deeper into the history i saw the uh, past of this casteism uh, and how hinduism has treated the lower caste people so that's when i abandoned hinduism as well now i consider my, myself only atheist so i uh, earlier i used to consider myself as a hindu atheist now i am only atheist i so caste system is basically a reason that i left hinduism not god god i left uh, like uh, long back okay yeah. okay so i understand I left... that now yeah because um i was talking to another indian uh, gentleman about the same thing i asked him how atheism is viewed within uh hinduism because i've read that um you know atheists are accepted within hinduism you know it doesn't yeah. automatically um exclude you from the uh, hindu community and yes. i kind of viewed it as how uh, jews in america consider themselves jewish atheists because most of the uh jews here in america are considered jewish atheists and for them it's mostly traditional and cultural and not so much because they believe in god or that they believe everyone in the country should live their lives according to judaism yeah yeah so that that was uh, an identity i tried to explore for some time but uh, seeing the history of hinduism seeing what it has done to lower caste people i did not think like hinduism is supposed to be a great religion or anything so yeah okay and with the caste system how how rigid is the caste system you think today as it was you know like maybe in the time of gandhi ah uh, yeah so basically caste system uh, i mean if we talk about villages it is very prevalent currently uh, i uh, also men mentioned yesterday so basically people do not marry outside their caste uh, this is not always the case but this is in majority of the cases so basically uh, i can say this is just an estimate uh, i have not read any survey but i'm telling from a personal experience uh, in my village no one would marry outside their caste from where i am and any of my friends they will not marry outside their caste 
and only in big cities if if you become so so like uh, rich and all like you don't care about what people in your village thinks Th then only you can think of marrying outside your caste they, and if your family is very open minded and all so then you can uh, think of marrying outside a caste otherwise i i would say 60 70% cases people still marry inside their caste so this is a caste system you know, like uh, this uh, an example of casteism this is more prevalent in the, in, in the northern states so northern states is basically what uh, where the hindi is hindi is the primary language so th those are the states where the system is more prevalent there is a case of honor killing so what happens in honor killing is uh, let's say there has been many instances of it like uh, if a father find out that his daughter is having an affair with the lower caste guy then in some cases they just kill the daughter they straight straight away kill the daughter so that is something called honor killing and that has many instances like uh, this has happened many times so yeah it's still very rigid especially marrying outside of caste is not that common as we we would like it is still very a, a very common practice to only marry inside your caste so yeah that's that's the basic i mean uh, thing that should be removed yeah that's horrible and actually in the United States, um, you know, years and years and years ago, when social class was more rigid, you know, the amount of money wouldn't necessarily mean that you moved up socially, or at least not to the same level as what, you know, they would call someone who is a blue blood. And basically, a blue blood is someone who comes from uh, basically a long line of wealthy and refined people. So a blue blood, for example, would be like the Rockefeller family. You know, their family has been prominent for years and years and years. Now, Donald Trump would not be on the same level as a Rockefeller or a Rothschild, you know, a family that has a much longer and prominent history. Yeah. Yeah. And there's actually um, a book that's really it's kind of uh, essential Amer American reading called The Great Gatsby. And it's about a guy named James uh, Gatz. And he grows up lower class, but um, through the, uh, basically this was uh, in the prohibition era. So through selling alcohol illegally, he becomes very wealthy, but he's still not able to escape his lower class past. and um they eventually find out that he's not a blue blood you know there's a character named tom who told him you know this is in our blood we were born like this so even though he was richer than a lot of the people who came to his house they still looked down on him because he wasn't in their social class but now i feel like um we're at a point in america where you know being successful is actually starting to become more important than your social class like somebody like elon musk or bill gates nobody cares that you know they don't have you know that they don't come from a long line of rich people and i think we're living in a time where entrepreneurship is more respected than what was given to you because when you think about it it's actually pretty backwards why would you respect and praise people just because they were born rich you know and why would you look down on the people who had to work for something you know it doesn't make any sense at all yep yeah it's totally based on where you were born so that's that's basically what they what is inherently wrong with the caste system that's how caste system started like i told you manu converted this uh, varna system to caste system basically and uh, yeah he converted it to basically started the nepotism uh, kind of thing so yeah that's how uh, i mean yeah. still it is and you said this was around 500 AD? Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I'm not very sure about it, but uh, I think it was around that time, yeah. Okay, yeah. so how is, what is it like to be a Christian in uh, India? Because, you know, we uh, hear, mostly hear about Muslims and Hindus, but we don't hear too much about what it's like to be a Christian in India. Yeah, so basically the Christians in India actually are the lower caste people of Hinduism. Okay. So when when the British uh, came to India, 
so they came up with uh, all the missionaries came to uh, came to india as well that so they tried to convert people so what happened is uh, the most vulnerable people who wanted to leave hinduism were lower caste people because uh, they were uh, being ill treated by hinduism they were not being fairly treated in, in hinduism also they were poor in some cases so they were uh, in some cases they were offered money to convert to Christi uh, christianity in some cases uh, they they converted because uh, they wanted to be treated very fairly so uh, it was okay till now but uh, again as uh, this concept of hindu nationalism grows uh, the christians here are mocked with a name called rice back converts so rice back converts is uh, what does that mean that uh, someone who converted for a bag of rice oh so wow that is yeah uh, so the basic, basically mock christians that you are a rice back convert because most of the christians are uh, from the lower caste of hinduism so they converted to christianity because of and because they were poor and missionaries uh, offered them food and all so yeah so that's how they are mocked as, as of now i told you a story about kerala so there was a hindu kingdom in uh, state of kerala and uh, in that hindu kingdom lower caste people had to uh, pay a breast tax the, wim the women in lower caste had to pay, pay a breast tax so that they can cover their breasts so this was a hierarchy like uh, lower caste uh, women had had to keep their breast open inside of upper caste men and upper caste upper caste women had to keep their breast open when it, when they go to the temples so basically this was a, an hierarchy like god and then upper caste people and then lower caste people if you want to cover your breast then you have to pay the tax so that was basically very humiliating so the, when you go to kerala you see a lot of population of kerala has converted to christianity and islam in the recent times and most of these belong to this lower caste so yeah being a christian was okay is okay i would i would say there is uh, no real danger to being a christian but uh, amount of hate that that is growing and this uh, mocked up word that rice back convert is convert is being used more and more now nowadays and which is yeah basically the hate is growing i would say uh, towards christians and muslims alike okay yeah because you know when you say like rice what what's the term you use rice converter rice back rice, rice back, back converter. rice back converter yeah because i mean that's usually um how persecution starts you know like first they uh dehumanize the people and then you know it usually goes from there um but um how much do you think that the uh colonial occupation has shaped the uh hindu perception of christianity because i know mother teresa is really popular you know as someone who did a lot of good work in india but you know after you know actually doing real investigations you know people like christopher hitchin found out that you know that wasn't really the case that's not what was really going on and she actually did a lot of bad in india yeah yeah she was she was basically on a mission to convert people so she she did uh, help people but she she was actually on a mission to convert people so she was basically a missionary you can say so the uh, colonialism basically uh, did alter a perception about christianity because uh, it is say, uh, seeing as an occupational force so basically uh, when we talk about indian history nowadays uh, if a hindu nationalist talk about indian history so we have been under a uh, muslim occupation like uh, india has hindu kings for a, for a long time yeah like since, Bavar and the mughal kings yeah yeah so since uh, until 1200 we had hindu kings in 1200 afghans and turks came to india so they started ruling india they started con conquering most of the india and since uh, 1200 ad uh, the muslims started ruling then came the mughals who were again muslims but uh, from a different origin they came around in yeah 1526 is when babar came so uh, again uh, till 1700 you can say 1700 was Aurangzeb uh, when Aurangzeb died 1707. So that is what uh, is considered the Mughal rule. And soon after that, 1757 is when uh, British colonial, colonial empire is supposed to start in India. Soon after that, the British came. So again, we had a, a 150 years of colonialism period. So it is considered that those uh, 1200 to 1947 and those 750 years, India has been under a foreign rule. And that foreign rule is described as invaders. Actually, basically, yeah, they were invaders, 
so that that is where uh, uh, you can say the hate against Islam and Christianity comes up because uh, it is said that uh, Christ, uh, Islam and Christians ruled over India, which was a predominantly Hindu country, and they converted the Hindu population into uh, Muslims into Christians, and now we have to share our land with these peoples and all. So yeah, this is, there there is basically again that is, that is a polarizing point in the history. Yes, yeah, so there's an author named Shashi Tharoor, and you've heard of him, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so he, well, he's wrote multiple uh, books, but the one that I've actually read is called An Era of Darkness, the British Empire in India. And according to him, with I think within a 10-year period, the British were responsible for 35 million dead Indians. And so, you know, it's it's just inescapable for something like that to uh, affect the Hindu perception of Christians. And a lot of Christians, they'll talk about, you know, what uh, Joseph Stalin did in communist Russia, and they'll point to that as an example of atheist um, inhumanity or atheist terror, but they'll never talk about something like British colonialism, which was just as disastrous, which was just as horrific. And if you read that book, uh, Shashi Tharoor, he said that what happened in India reminds him of what happened in communist Russia and communist China, but nobody ever talks about it. Yeah, so basically, as I as I said yesterday as well, so uh, Winston Churchill is a big, a big example. Winston Churchill is considered a World War II hero in UK. So, uh, but what happened is uh, there was a famine in Bengal. So Bengal was a region in British India, and currently it is whole country of Bangladesh plus Indian state of Bengal. So that was the Bengal region in uh, British India. There was a famine in Bengal in 1943, I think. So what happened, the World War II was also going on. And since India was a British colony, uh, in, uh, British used to exploit Indian. They, they uh, used our farmers to produce crop, uh, crops and then they used to take those crops to uh, Britain. So uh, the World War II was going on, their uh, army had ample some supplies of the uh, crops and food and all. The Bengal needed that food. Bengal had a very, very bad famine. But Winston Churchill refused to uh, provide any food to the Indian. The food that was grown in India, but uh, we were refused that food. The Bengal people of Bengal were refused that food. And Winston Churchill said that it is India Indians' own fault. They had they have brought the, this payment to, onto themselves because they are breeding like rabbits. So he was basically, uh, in my view, he was just a big racist. He can be considered a war hero in UK, but for India, he is responsible for millions of deaths in Bengal famine, and he's a big racist. So yes, yeah, that that is uh, that that those are things that will actually uh, polarize people. Like uh, if if even I if I hear about it, I can I cannot uh, I mean think of Winston Churchill as a good guy, no matter what he did in the World War Two. Right. Yeah. I mean, from what I read, yeah, because from what I read, this was intentional the people were intentionally starved and as they were starving you know their own crops were going to the uk yes yeah almost two to two to three million people died in one single famine two to three million in bengal and winston churchill was a person responsible for all those deaths yeah that's insane and you know it's just one of those things that's never really talked about just like the uh native american genocide um yeah there's a book that i uh purchased uh not too long ago called the great evil christianity the bible and the native american genocide and just you know when people think of native americans they only think of the Native Americans in what we now call the United States, they don't think of, you know, the natives of Mexico or the natives of the Caribbean and yeah. other the, parts of Latin America, yeah. South America. Yeah. Well. yeah, yeah. And so the the accepted or the generally accepted uh, number is 56 million dead Native Americans due to Christian colonialism. So this was over a gradual period and 56 million people ended up losing their lives. 
and nobody ever talks about it. You know, a lot of scholars view it as the worst genocide in human history, but nobody talks about it. And yeah, so yeah, I think a lot of people don't talk about it because it's so detrimental to the um, to the American image. You know, to the idea that we're the good guys and to the idea that our country was founded, you know, by the grace of God instead of by the sword. And, you know, that's one of the main reasons people will never talk about it because in that book, the author is a Native American man who has a PhD in Native American studies. And he said, you know, we'll only talk about genocide if it's other people doing it. You know, if it's the Germans doing it to the Jews or the Turks doing it to the Armenians, but we'll never talk about, you know, the genocide that happened here, you know, and it's really sad. Yeah, so as I said yesterday, in in uh, that aspect, I actually respect what Germans are doing. So Germans are basically uh, teaching the kids in the school about this, uh, about Hitler and what happened, uh, how Hitler came to the power. So they are basically teaching everything from the history so that it does not happen again. So that is that is very important thing. We should always be teaching anything that wrong that happened in, in your country. So it should not happen again. The polarization should not uh, happen again. So the people people should be prepared for it. That is uh, something I respect Germany for doing it. It is actually not easy if, if you you have to set aside your nationalistic pride and everything. So that's how only you can incorporate into the um, education. Well, in our country, it seems like a lot of people just don't want to set aside nationalistic pride, you know, for like with Columbus Day and the statues of people who own slaves. And, you know, I'm very big in the history. I respect history. And I don't think that history itself should be whitewashed. But I do have a problem with us glorifying, you know, people who did these terrible things and they weren't heroes. They're only heroes to the people that they didn't negatively impact. Yep. You know, yep. just like Winston Churchill, of course, he's a hero to lots of people in Great Britain, but to the people that he negatively impacted, to the people whose families he starved to death, he'll never be a hero. Yep. Yeah. And so, you know, I think you have to find a balance because in America, you know, just talking about a lot of these things will make people view you as anti-American or they'll say, you know, well, if you don't like it here, you should leave. And I don't think that's the right way to go about it. You know, I think that there can be a balance. You can accept history and you don't have to totally erase it without, um, you can accept it and you can analyze it without glorifying it. You know, that's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I mean, this, this is the basic human nature. Like uh, no one is perfect. No one is uh, all good. Uh, everyone is uh, some good, some bad, some some uh, some things they have done uh, better things, some things they have done worse. So we should just just teach the, these things as they are, because uh, let's say the American found, founding fathers that we talk about. So American founding fathers, uh, they fought against Britain and uh, they founded an independent America. But at the same time, they owned slaves. So we, sh we can just teach that as it is. Like, yeah, they, they had contributed to American independence like this, but uh, yeah, they were, um, they had, uh, they also had slaves. So that is some, not something like, uh, we, uh, we don't need to uh, portray them as something evil. We don't need to portray them right. as very good. Yeah. So that is basically, everyone is uh, in gray area, I would say. Right. Yeah. Like I don't necessarily view like George Washington as an evil person because, yeah. uh, there's a biography of him that I read by Ron Chernow called um, George Washington, A Life. And um, in the book, you kind of uh, you kind of get a sense of the uh, the atmosphere that shaped him when he was 11 years old. He inherited slaves, you know, yeah. at the age of 11. So this is the only life that he knew. Yeah. Yeah, so basically you can say like uh, he did not consider it that it was a big deal owning a slave. He did not think about the human right aspect. Of course, uh, he, were, he was at fault for not thinking about this 
because uh, in the later generations someone thought that this is this is not right like having slaves is not right they are also humans so someone someone came up with this idea someone thought no they do same human rights as us so of course uh, they were at fault for not uh, seeing this but uh, you can i mean uh, say that they were not entirely at fault that uh, the the condition that gr- they grew up in uh, that cemented their mindset like this so they did not see the problem in their ways the problems in their customs correct you know and if you read the book you actually get to see other sides of him you know like for example um he had a slave named billy lee and billy lee was in love with a slave who was owned by another master and so george washington he did everything he could to track down that specific uh slave master so he could reconnect billy lee with this person and you know i'm not saying this justifies what he does or what he yeah. did but it still shows that he was a human and george yeah. washington actually uh he met a slave girl in person named uh, Phyllis Wheatley and Phyllis Wheatley was a black girl who was a slave but she was educated by the white people who owned her and she's considered the first uh black american poet and George Washington uh met her in person so you know once you read the book you get to see um different aspects of his life you know not so much just the slave master or just the general but other aspects of his life that a lot of people don't know about and again i'm not saying that this justifies uh the things that he did in any way i'm just saying that he was a human being too and i actually think that when we um when we start to dehumanize people we're letting them off the hook you know when we call this person a devil we're kind of uh taking the responsibility off of them and we're we're putting it on something that's imaginary yep yeah yeah so everything should be te- uh, taste as as it is we can, uh, we can we should always see people as a, as gray that's what yeah i was saying but yeah you know history is just like it's just like with uh a holy text you know you take what's good and you filter it you know you don't try to incorporate uh those things into your life or into your culture just like with uh what people do with the confederate flag you know personally yeah. you know they have the right to have the confederate flags waving outside their houses and on their trucks but you know when you break it down and you really look at it what they're trying to do is revive uh images that are antisocial yeah 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 something uh, for that confederate flag as yes. that that is very wrong actually i think uh, it should not exist that flag uh, i would think that it should be banned because i mean uh, that was basically uh, a support a sup- uh, support to the slavery uh, the people who fought beneath that banner were basically supporters of slavery so that that flag actually carries a, a very anti social meaning so yeah yeah you know the funny thing is that a lot of these people who wave the confederate flag they consider themselves patriots yeah right? and they think you're not a patriot because you think that their unpatriotic behavior is unpatriotic you know it just doesn't make any sense at all yeah it's it's also a little different i think right in north and south so people in north do not consider confederate flag as patriotic or something right right yeah i mean you're definitely more likely to see that in south but i see it here in michigan too you know it's okay. crazy because a lot of people here have never even been to the south they don't have any relatives in the south and i think they do it just for like shock value just to get a reaction out of people because they know yeah, so people are going to react to it yeah so that is basically you can say that, that is the rise of white nationalism yeah that is so is there like an equivalent of that in india or no i mean we don't have any flag at such which uh, anyone has any problems with uh, i mean we have a saffron for uh, on like hinduism has a saffron flag 
but uh, i don't think anyone has a problem with the saffron flag as of now no hindu even secular hindus do not have any problem with the uh, saffron flag all the religions carry their own flag like sikhism has uh, somewhat i mean i don't know the exact uh, english name for that color but it's it's called kesari in uh, hindi and punjabi so that is almost uh, like saffron but a little yellowish and uh, uh, similarly islam has uh, the green flag so people do not have uh, like uh, much problem with the flags but, but because those flags are ne- have never been associated with uh, something like this something like slavery and all so those pla- uh, those flags are still considered uh, you can say uh, pious like uh, they are considered only uh, something that should be worshiped and all so yeah nothing of that sort exists in india i would say okay how about the swastika how is the swastika viewed within hinduism uh yeah this is uh, basically swastika is uh, is viewed very favorably uh, we respect it actually uh, the nazi regime that used the swastika if you if you see uh, the nazi symbol and the swastika you will compare it there is a great deal of uh, different difference between those symbols so that the na- nazi symbol is not same as swastika uh, and uh, no one even uh, in the villages people don't even know that it it was a symbol used by hitler people use use it everywhere people uh, decorate their house with it so no one considered it uh, as anything evil or anything it is associated with hinduism it is a big part of hinduism so yeah nothing as of sort like uh, we do not uh, even associate with it with him hitler because we know those two are very different things Right. Yeah, you know there are two different things, but I think that a lot of people, you know, would be turned off by Hinduism if they saw that symbolism just because of its history. You know, even even if something has a definitive meaning, it can be overshadowed by the connotative meaning, you know, when someone else appropriates it and um they're because of their actions a negative stigma is attached to it uh yeah so basically uh the thing is uh hinduism is not at fault because of this uh, i mean that was hitler's fault hitler basically uh, used so many wrong symbols uh, he started this uh, aryan race ideology that he said that uh, uh, people living in germany is are, are aryans so later historians and uh, all the scientists prove that no they do not belong to the aryan race again that was a wrong symbolism similarly he used the swastik uh, swastik and uh, he used it, it as a nazi symbol so that is something that is uh, wrong with hitler so hindus will not uh, not uh, abandon their symbol because there was some guy who wrongly used that symbol so that is the problem with the western world only only western world confuses between swastik and nazi symbol the hinduism uh, any peop- anyone in india do not confuse with it everyone understand the difference between those symbols Right. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I don't think the uh Hindu people are responsible at all for what uh Adolf Hitler did and for the symbol that he uh misused, but um do you ever get people in India who see that symbolism and, you know, they kind of freak out? No, no. The nothing uh never this does not happen ever. Uh, so everyone knows that this is the symbol belongs to Hinduism. and they do not think of it as as a nazi symbol for even one minute N- not even muslim christians in india see it as a nazi symbol oh wow that's very good you know that's very interesting yeah. because most people i know in america i'm just speaking from an american perspective they don't really know um the true meaning of uh the uh symbol so i remember actually uh this was years and years ago a friend of mine he put a swastika on his facebook page and he did it just because he knew people would react to it and yeah. he he already knew that it didn't have anything to do with the nazis or hitler but he did it anyway just to kind of get a reaction out of people yeah yeah you would i mean there are visual differences between those two symbols if you if you just search the nazi symbol and swastika yeah. you will see the difference uh, yeah. like right there yeah. i mean i think uh, there is uh, orientation difference uh one is clockwise one is anti clockwise or something like that so there is a visible difference uh, that's how you can differentiate those right. those two symbols right
Yeah. Okay. So another thing I wanted to ask you is how your family feels about you being an atheist. Uh, they don't feel good actually. <laughs> yeah, I, I have had uh, many debates with the, uh, my family on this. So they keep forcing me to uh, pray to the God. And uh, <laughs> they, they keep telling me that uh, you won't get uh, any success in life if you don't pray to the God. And I keep telling them. I keep telling them that uh, it's been 10 years that I've been not praying to the God. <laughs> okay, I, I'm doing good in my life. <laughs> I don't need God. So yeah, they keep trying to force me to uh, start uh, uh, praying to God. But yeah, <laughs> that is actually, uh, I mean, they're not very okay with it, but uh, they don't physically force me or anything, but they keep saying, in they keep insisting, you can say. Yeah, I have people in my family like that too. You know, they know that they're not going to uh they know that they're not going to be able to convert me or convince me by telling me about their um, you know, anecdotes and whatnot, but they still try to uh nudge me in that direction. Like my grandma, um, my uh paternal grandmother, she's uh very devout and you know, sometimes I'll be talking to her on the phone and she'll say, you know, you live a good life, but I think it would be even better if you would accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> you know? And so then I say, you know, I tell her, well, I can lie to you and I can say that I accept him, but do you want me to lie to you? And she'll <laughs> say, like, no. And I told her, you know, belief is not like a light switch that you turn on and off, you know. Uh, but I yeah. told her, if you want me to lie to you, I can do that, you know, if it'll make you feel better. Because, you know, that's exactly what I'll be doing. I'll be lying. Yeah, it, it should come from the heart. So if you feel something uh, from your heart that you believe in something, then only you should follow religion. Right. And I know uh, when I talked to you uh, the other day, you were telling me that... Um, in India, you know, you're not likely to get killed for making fun of the uh, Hindu gods, but they will beat you. And after they beat you, they'll tell you that you should be lucky because if it was Muslims, they would kill you. Yeah. <laughs> so that is that is basically a very, very uh, funny explanation actually you get from uh, Hindu nationalists. So what happens is if uh, someone is beaten for insulting, is insulting Hindu gods, and then you discuss it on Twitter with someone uh, who follows this Hindu nationalist ideology, they will only tell you one thing. They will point point to uh, point you to France and they will say, you know what happened in France? There was a teacher who uh, made a, uh, who showed people a poster of Muhammad and he was killed. Now you should be grateful that you're living in India. So that's why <laughs> you are only getting beaten. Otherwise, if you would have been in a Muslim country or if you have been criticizing Muhammad in India, you, your head would have been chopped off. So <laughs> this is right. It's okay. You're only getting beaten. Right. Yeah. So I mean, that's uh, that's a poor justification for beating somebody up. You know, that's not a yeah. good <laughs> argument because um, you know, beating somebody can lead to death. You know, I mean, people get killed. You know, all the time, even when the person didn't intend to kill them. You know, like if you got somebody on the ground and you're kicking them in the head, you know. I mean, that person can easily end up dead if they suffer enough trauma. Yeah. Yeah, this this has ap happened actually in India in few cases that was basically related to cow-based lynching. So when uh, this comment came to the power, so the beef beef was uh, used, beef used to be uh, pop, like uh, many people used to uh, you, uh, eat beef. So they started banning beef. Uh, so in... Uh, at that time, there was uh, some Muslim people who were considered to be eating beef. Uh, a mob of people uh, took them somewhere and started beating them. And in some of those cases, people were killed. because uh, So that's what we call mob lynching in India. So you can uh, search about mob lynching in India. You will find, find many incidents in which people beat people to, the, people to death because they suspected that they were eating beef or they were carrying beef which uh, in most of the cases that uh, investigation revealed that they were only carrying chicken or, or anything. So, yeah, that is also a thing. Wow. Yeah, see here, we don't really, I mean, there are people who are vegetarians or vegans. And I mean, of course, they, um, they want other people to 
adopt adopt their lifestyle, not just because they want people to be like them, but because they feel that it's good for the environment and it's good for animals. And I think they have some legitimate reasons, but, you know, we don't hear about people getting beat to death, you know, for eating a hamburger or something like that. Uh, yeah, so basically, uh, the, the reason is, uh, the explanation is uh, that Hindu nationalists will give you that cow is considered sacred in Hinduism, cow. Right. So and they do not have uh, any problem if you if you are eating any other animals meat. So they only have problems if you are eating cow meat. So because cow is considered sacred in Hinduism, yeah. cow is considered as mother. So that's why uh, it is. Uh, like, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, I've uh, I've talked to people about that before. You know, because uh, you know, in some places in Asia they eat dog, and yeah. uh, when a lot of people in America find out about that, they they like really freak out because a dog is kind of uh, sacred, you know, in the Western world. Yeah. And um, so I'll say, well, you know, the cow is sacred in India and you're eating hamburgers on a regular basis. So, you know, you got yeah. <laughs> all over a billion Indians who would probably be upset with you, you know, so you have to look at it from their perspective. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So that is uh, a select the selective, uh, you can say selectively saying that this and this animal's meat you should not eat. I don't think that has any logic to it. Uh, right. Either you don't eat, don't eat any animal's meat or you eat all of them. Right. That, that is how it should be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So I mean, I don't know a whole lot about why the cow is sacred. So why is the cow sacred? Uh, basically, what happened in Hinduism? It is uh, almost as uh, say uh, this is as old as the religion of. Uh, Greeks and Roman mythologies. So what happened is everything that provided a source of food or that provided a source of living was considered as a god. So let's say the sun sun is there, sun provides us with the light. So we called him, uh, we called the sun as a god. So there is a uh, sun god in every, every mythology. You say, I mean, in Greek mythology, there's Apollo, he's the sun god. In Egyptian mythology, there is Ra, I think he's sun god. So similarly, everything that was essential to the life was considered a god. Similarly, in India, every family had cows. So the, the cows were responsible, like uh, they used to give milks and milk was very uh, important for children especially. So the something that is providing you anything uh, to live your life that was considered as a god or goddess. Like uh, there is a river Ganges, I think you've heard of it. Yes. So river Ganges is also considered mother because uh, that is also considered a, a goddess because uh, Ganges covered a lot of area in India and it provide uh, an irrigation system to the fields and it, it is the life source of many Indians and has been in the past. So that is also considered a goddess. And that that is a system throughout, throughout all the old religions, all the, you can say, uh, the religions which has multiple gods, uh, the Romans, the Greeks, the Egyptians, the Hindus. Hindu, Hinduism is a religion of that time only. So that's why it has uh, something common with the, that, that religion. And that's how uh, cows came to be mothers and okay. goddess. Yeah. yeah, that actually makes sense to um, kind of like uh, personify things such as like mountains or rivers or the sun or... Moon, yeah, everything. Yeah. Everything that, that you can see like uh, uh, air is, there. there is a god of air in Hinduism. We call him Vayudev. So uh, it is considered that air is flowing because Vayudev wants it. We have a god of rain. He is called Indradev. So we oh, consider yeah, when when Indradev wants, then only uh, the rain happens. So that that is something you can say. Uh, the science was not developed. People considered everything uh, as science was not developed. knew that sun was just a uh, big uh, big round. Uh, fiery thing and moon was something you can uh, actually walk on uh, like a few centuries later so yeah they called everything as gods okay yeah you cut out for a little bit but i think i got the gist of what you were saying and i it makes a lot of sense you know to um give agency to certain things like uh, michael Shermer. he's talked about how um we evolved to give um, agency to things, even when they're not alive, because it was about survival. For example, um, 
our ancestors who thought that, you know, the wind was alive and thought that the trees were alive, those people who were kind of like on edge and thought that everything was alive, those were the ones who survived. And for example, let's say that you hear a noise in the bushes and you think that it's only the wind, but it happens to be a lion and it kills you, you know, then you just yeah. made a, you know, what he calls like a type two error. So it was the ones yeah. who gave agency to everything who were more likely to survive, ironically. And this is actually, you know, kind of like the, what's the word I'm looking for? The uh, primordial origins of organized religion, basically. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that that's uh, that's how I mean. Uh, there is there are a lot of similarities between the old world religion. Uh, those are actually extant now. So that is also uh, uh, something that Hinduism has. Like we are the oldest religion on the planet. So that is also uh, something people take proud uh, pride in, and that is something also that uh, uh, pushes people towards. Uh, like uh, when someone tells tells them that uh, your religion is going to be extinct. If you don't uh, arm yourself, if you if you don't become more religious, so right. that that also is uh, act, actually acting as a polarizing force. Okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, another question I have to ask you is kind of off the top of my head is uh, if you've ever read uh, I think how you pronounce his name is Cotilia. I know he has another name too, but the one Cotilia, I remember, yeah. Cotilia. Yeah, yeah. Cotilia. Yeah. yeah, have you read that yeah. before? I mean, uh, I don't think I have read the book, but yeah, I've heard about Cotillia. So okay. no, I haven't read, read his book. Well, I know a lot of people call him like the Indian version of Machiavelli. So I was wondering if maybe his, uh, I was wondering if his uh, philosophies had any impact on the caste system as well. Uh, actually, Cotillia is uh, actually more popularly known as Chanakya in India. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So basically, Chanakya, uh, his books actually, uh, I have had, uh, I have had actually read the summaries of it, his books. So his books are mostly concentrated on warfare. Actually, he talks about. Uh, I don't think there is any uh, caste system in in his book because I'll tell you the story about his life. So Chanakya actually trained a normal guy, a normal boy, who was just a normal villager. He trained that boy and he made that boy king of that kingdom, of the current kingdom. Actually, uh, there was Nanda kingdom. I think uh, Nand kingdom was there. And that was the kingdom because of which Alexander had, had to return from India. You know, Alexander yeah. was conquering uh, all the world, but uh, he did not enter India because uh, the Nand empire in uh, Bihar, actually, Magadh, Magadh empire. So they had a very large army. And uh, Alexander's forces were tired of uh, tired of like uh, roaming throughout the world, and uh, so they, not, they did not want to enter India because uh, the, uh, Nand has uh, so big of an army. So once Chanakya went to visit this Nand king, and he insulted Chanakya. So Ch Chanakya decided to take revenge. So he went into the village. He found this boy who was very talented. The the boy used to uh, make a group of people. He he used to pass decisions. Yeah, he used to act like a king. So he was very wise, the boy, and very courageous. So Chanakya decided to train him. The the boy is, I think, his Chandragupta. I think, yeah, it was Chandragupta. So he trained Chandragupta, and Chandragupta is considered like a very uh, big king in in the Indian history. So he trained Chandragupta. He told him the things that uh, how you should rule, how how you should uh, like uh, plan your politics. So Chanakya, uh, the book that uh, that he wrote and the rules that he defined, it called it's called Chanakya Niti. That means rules of Chanakya. You can say loosely translated. So those are mostly about politics, and it's still mostly used in context of politics and warfare and how how do you run uh, an empire. So I I won't say it had any effect on uh, caste system, but yeah, Chanakya's book actually uh, were not very positive about women so they were a little sexist in nature so chanakya actually called women as dis uh, distraction he said people uh, should not uh, see women as something like uh, they are just a distraction people should not 
uh, consider them valuable or anything avoid women and you will get succeed in, in your life so you can say th those are some uh, little sexist in nature and mostly chanakya is credited for his uh, political views and all yeah 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 that's why they call him the uh, indian machiavelli and i've yeah. read about four or five biographies of alexander the great so i've heard of uh chandra gupta that's that's uh how it's spelled in the books that i've read but i didn't yeah. know that he was trained by uh Cautilli. i didn't know that they had a connection i didn't know that it was the same time period yeah it was exactly the same time period so chandra gupta uh, and then uh started his own empire that was the Maurya empire yeah and the this Maurya was empire. Yeah. yeah but um the uh when alexander the great was in india that was kind of when he was getting towards the end of his life and yeah it's when his men started to get tired and yes you know, yeah they started to get tired and uh there was a uh, I mean, two, three big reasons that uh, they did not press on to India. So one of them was like uh, they had uh, a war, which is basically currently you can say India-Pakistan border. Uh, at that place, there was a king called Porus. So uh, his army army fought fought with Porus. So that was actually a bloody war, and Porus fought bravely, but he lost. But uh, uh, there was a significant amount of losses on the Alexander side. So that was actually a fresh war and people uh, his army was actually feeling uh, somewhat demotivated also they were tired from like uh, they have been away from home like for like uh, i think uh, for half a year or something uh, his campaign was very long so they wanted to go home and one other big reason is uh, the next army that he was going to press to the next uh, reason he was going to press to was this magad empire and Magadh Empire was, uh, uh, it was stretched from like, uh, let's say, the modern day Punjab to Bihar, which is a very big reason. And the Magadh Empire had a very large army. So that's that's how uh, they did not want to fight a, such, such a large army when they were so tired and uh, so exhausted from, from from all the travel and battles. So that's when uh, Sikandar, uh, Alexander decided to drop his campaign. And then in the, uh, in the way, I think he died in Babylon, right? Yeah, yep. I think he was around the age of 32 when he died. Um, mm -hmm. Nobody knows exactly how he perished, but yeah, I think he was about 32. And if I remember right, uh, he kind of tried to manipulate uh, the people into going further, which they, uh, I guess it worked. But um, there's a channel that I watch on YouTube called Generals and Kings and he recreated alexander's speech you know i mean i'll probably give you a link to it once we uh, get off here but it's a really great speech and you know it's like he made the people feel guilty about um you know he made the people feel guilty about wanting to go home about wanting to be with their families you know which shows that he was a master manipulator yeah yeah so basically you have to be master manipulator so uh, he was taking his army uh, all the way from like uh, uh, alexandria to india so that is a very long way you have to be a master manipulator to make your army keep going right. otherwise they would have returned from somewhere in afghanistan or iraq or something yeah and he tried to throw some almost kind of throw some religion in there too i think because um prior to uh Prior to arriving in India, if I remember right, he had killed uh, one of his uh, longtime friends named uh, Clytus. He uh, threw a spear at him and killed him when they got into an argument. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, not too long after that, the people started to uh, mutiny and they wanted to go home and they started to uh, voice their uh, dissatisfaction with this uh, continuous crusade. And so, he said that, you know, he said that when he killed uh, his friend, Zeus was uh, basically Zeus was punishing him by making the people mutiny, you know. Yeah. And so instead of kind of like acknowledging that the people were tired and that they wanted to go home, you know, he's kind of like, well, this is me being punished for killing my friend. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, that is actually. Uh, I haven't heard that story yet. I, I would actually uh, research some more on it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he, he, his life was so big that uh, I actually have a book in my library. Uh, hold on, let me see if I, I. It's probably right behind me. Hold on. Uh, okay. Okay, yeah, this book here called um, Alexander's Lovers. Okay, so, yeah. This is just about all the relationships in his life, you know? Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's how big his life was. They, they could write a book just on his relationships. Okay, so, uh, I mean, uh, are those accounts, uh, like uh, the stories, are, are those verified or though? Or uh, are those stories like uh, legendary in uh, nature? Oh, actually, no. This book is about real relationships that he had. Okay, okay. But I mean, there are a lot of books out there. Um, people have written uh, historical novels, and even you know, even in ancient times, people wrote um, you know <clears throat> mythological stories about him. And um, have you ever heard of the Alexander Romance? No, actually, no. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll probably send you a link to that too. But the Alexander Romance is basically what it says, you know, uh, romanticization of his life. Okay. Because, you know, a lot of people viewed him as not human. You know, they believe, viewed him as a god, you know, even, even in his own time. There was yeah. a Greek writer, there was a Greek writer, I can't remember his name, but he couldn't believe that Alexander the Great was dead. He said that if Alexander had died, you know, the the smell from his carcass would basically, you know, reach the whole world because, you know, he was a giant, basically. And, you yeah. know, that's just a paraphrase what he actually said, but that's the general idea, you know. He said that if Alexander had died, everyone in the world would know. Yeah, so yeah, basically, I mean, uh, it was uh, somewhere around 350 BC, that's that's when Alexander's time was, I think. So that is, we can say, two and a half thousand years ago. So that's why uh, I think, uh, I mean, some many accounts are uh, mostly legendary. So uh, that's what I thought. And, but if you're saying that, like, uh, there are real stories, yeah, then I would actually study into it. Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's, there's certain things that are, mythological then there are certain things that are legendary or like anecdotal like a, i mean there's a lot of uh anecdotes what probably the most famous anecdote is about him and a philosopher named diogenes do you know who diogenes is no okay diogenes is considered the first cynic you know basically he um what's the word i'm looking for he was very misanthropic you know he didn't like people and okay. so alexander the great approaches him and he said i'm alexander the king and he said you okay. know what he said what can i do for you and he said you can stop blocking my sunlight you know okay. and uh so then he's you know he kind of like reasserts himself he's like i'm alexander the king and then Diogenes says, and I am Diogenes, you know? So in, in other words, what he was saying is, I don't care who you are. And so, you know, that's kind of, I don't know, almost the basis of what um, his philosophy is. Okay. Yeah. But um, the, uh, the other part of the, well, the end of the anecdote goes like this. So when he said uh, when he said that to Alexander and offended him, his guards were about to kill, you know, Diogenes, but he told them not to. And he said that if I were not Alexander, I would be Diogenes, 
or <laughs> in other words, you know, if I couldn't be me, then I would choose to be Diogenes or, or you could look at that as if I couldn't be at the top of the world, then I'd rather be at the bottom like him. So, okay. Yeah. I mean, nobody, but, nobody knows if that's a real story, but it's a really popular yeah. anecdote about his life. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's a nice story actually. And then, uh, there's another one uh, that's pretty popular about him uh, because at this point the the army was really thirsty they were trying to find water and uh, some of the soldiers found some water and they brought it to Alexander in a golden helmet and he poured it out on the ground and he, you know he basically said no thank you because in effect what he was saying is if the rest of the army can't drink, then I don't want anything to drink. Yeah, yeah, that that definitely sounds <laughs> legendary. <laughs> well, you know, this this is a this is an anecdote meant to okay. highlight his virtues, and you know that's okay. what, and that's what you know the stories of the Bible are too. You know, and and you know, yeah. and to some to some effect, you know, it's to highlight the uh, virtues of the people like Moses, Jesus, King David. Yeah. And I actually did a video years ago because a lot of people, a lot of religious people, they'll say, why would somebody make this stuff up? You know, why would they, <laughs> why would they write down stories that aren't true? And, you know, there's multiple reasons why people would write down stories that aren't true. Like for example, cultural solidarity, you know, like what um like what you and I were talking about in India right now. The yeah. uh the Indians currently feel threatened by Muslims and other people who they think yeah. are a threat to Hinduism. And so, you know, in ancient times, people would make stories that would um, you know, encourage cultural solidarity. Yeah. And Another reason that I talked about in the video is uh, propaganda. You know, people made up stories for political propaganda, like uh, Ramses II, when the Egyptians went uh, to war with the Hittites in the largest chariot battle of the ancient world. Um, you know, a lot of historians um, think that the battle was a stalemate, but Ramses says that he took on the entire Hittite army by himself. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and you know, you know, that's not realistic, you know? Yeah. You know, yeah. you know, he had to have made it up because we know, you know, he didn't fight the entire chariot uh, army by himself. You know, that's just crazy. Yeah. And then another reason is people are just trying to explain the world. You know, people are trying to explain the world as best as they can you know, with the resources available to them. Yeah. Then another another reason is, um, what did I say? Another reason is a cautionary tale. You know, sometimes people write down stories for a cautionary tale. Like when you read the Bible and uh, they're carrying the Ark of the Covenant and Uzzah, he tried to steady the Ark so it wouldn't fall and God killed him just because he touched the ark, even though he was trying to um, steady it so it wouldn't fall, God strikes him dead. And a lot of people would say, you know, they'd say, why would, why would, uh, why would God do that to him when he was just trying to help? Because the, the message he's trying to send is that first off, you don't disobey God, even if you think that what you're doing is right. You know, yeah. you don't disobey God. And so the second thing he, the, that story conveys is that God can kill you anywhere at any time if he feels like it. Yeah. And then the uh, fifth, um, fifth uh, reason I brought up was entertainment value. You know, just like you and I, we talked about the Mahabharata and the Ramayana and how I like them because they're really enjoyable to read. Yeah. You know, so those are five reasons why people would make up stories that aren't true. Yeah. <laughs> and all those reasons make more sense than believing that those things actually happened. 
Yep. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think I need to go actually. So okay. I need to go to yeah. Bed. Yeah. We've been okay. talking for uh, about an hour and 40 minutes now and yeah. I really enjoyed it. And this time, yes, you know, yeah. this time it's actually recorded. So, uh, yeah. Um, so thanks for uh, being on here, Ashu, and I hope to talk to you again. I'm definitely going to send you some links to the videos I talked about. Okay. Yeah, sure. All right. Okay. Have a good night. Yeah, same to you. Thank you. All right. Bye.